Welcome again to Bioelectromagnetics. This is lecture number six. And uh, we will be talking today about electromagnetic processes in biology to uh, cells and tissues. So we've been talking uh, through lectures one and five up until the electromagnetic processes in biology in uh, molecules. And today we'll be focusing on cells and tissues. And depending on the time, we may also proceed to uh, organisms as well, lecture number seven. So let's see how much uh, how time goes, and we'll try to do either one or two lectures today. So we had this question last time, so we won't address it right now. But let's start with a review of electromagnetic processes in biology one, where we focused on molecules. So this is going to be a very quick review, just uh, what we spoke about last week. So in biology, we have several key ions. Uh, these ions are charged and uh, they're in the extracellular space outside the cell and also the intracellular space inside the cell. The extracellular key ions are sodium, uh, uh, calcium, and chloride. And a very important intracellular ion is potassium. Uh, and the negative ions intracellularly are various organics as well as uh, nucleic acids. In the membrane that separates the outside from the inside, we have channels that involve passive transport of ions, for example, potassium going out of the cell from inside. And we have pumps that pump out sodium and pump in uh, potassium. And this uh, ATP driven exchanger or pump is what generates this differential distribution of ions across the membrane. And then based on this differential distribution, namely potassium high inside and potassium low outside, we end up with a electrochemical gradient and uh, a net negative charge on the inside of the cell or a uh, voltage of about uh, minus uh, 90, minus 70, depends on the cell uh, millivolts. So this leads to the resting potential dominated by potassium conductance, potassium permeability here. Uh, this switches in the action potential to sodium permeability. And then when the action potential goes back to rest, it switches to the potassium permeability. These have all been done with patch clamp recording in which a small electrode or recording electrode is attached to a neuron. Uh, and these measurements of resistances and a current is put in and based on Ohm's law, voltage is equal to current times resistance, we can determine the voltage across the uh, cell with respect to a reference electrode outside the cell. We talked about passive transport and active transport. Active transport involves the coupling process that we discussed in the biology section that can pump uh, ions against their gradient and passive transport involves basically either diffusion or facilitated diffusion uh, down a uh, electrochemical or electrical uh, gradient or chemical gradient uh, as necessary. So these translocation proteins are various types, ion channels, carriers, transporters. And so the membrane is a very dynamic system that can uh, set up a charge they can set up a voltage, a charge difference. They can set up a voltage across that membrane and they can also change that voltage across the membrane. We talked about another protein called bacteria rhodopsin, a very important uh, protein in the bacteria that uh, pumps protons by virtue of a shift in a cofactor retinal molecule that's inside of it. So it goes from a cis uh, from a trans to a cis uh, configuration. That movement actually translocates a proton uh, slightly towards the outside, and that allows a proton to be accepted from the inside, so effectively it shifts a proton to the outside. Those gradients can be used to drive ATP production. This is the notion of coupling we talked about. So here's a proton pump. Uh, bacteria rhodopsin pumps protons out. 
they come back and produce ATP down the gradient. So that's how we produce energy in cells through these charge uh, changes. We talked about oxidation and reduction of comp carbon compounds. So carbon in its most oxidized state is carbon dioxide. That's the lowest energy state of carbon. We can regard the electrons around carbon as being distributed, uh, more dispersed. And as we know from basic electrostatics uh, and basic physics, charges when they are close together are higher energy than charges when they are distributed, like charges. So these electrons are distributed around the carbon towards the electronegative oxygen. This is in contrast to the reduced state of carbon, which is methane. Instead of oxygen, it's connected to uh, hydrogens, which are not so electronegative. And so the electrons are concentrated around carbon. Carbon has a greater share of the electrons and that concentration of electrons represents a higher energy. We talked about how uh, living organisms will break down that uh, carbon ultimately to carbon dioxide and in so doing distribute electrons more broadly. Carbohydrates, glucose are right in the middle. We talked about thermodynamics and the reversibility of processes and irreversibility. A reversible process is one that can be reversed in very small infinitesimal uh, changes. The system is always at equilibrium and it happens in infinite time. An irreversible process cannot be reversed. It's like an explosion. Finite changes, uh, distinct changes occur in the system, some smaller, some larger. Obviously, if they get smaller and smaller, they get closer to the irreversible situation. There is no equilibrium in the system and it happens in finite time. So irreversible processes are real processes and reversible processes are ideal processes. This is a little depiction of thermodynamic work. Some of you may have covered that in your physics classes. But the concept here is that if we want to extract pressure volume work, such as in an engine, that pressure times volume is equal to work. And if we do it in big steps, in other words, reversibly, we actually lose a little bit of that work. We can't do it all uh, along this ideal curve. And that lost work is inefficiency that's expressed as heat. If we can do that work in smaller steps, we get closer and closer to the reversible case, like here, and we lose less heat, we have more efficiency. Of course, the downside of going in small steps is it gets closer to infinite time, it gets much slower. Well, we put those two together, uh, the oxidation reduction and the thermodynamics and with glucose and all that, and we get a very interesting concept of how biological systems use electrons and uh, electromagnetic energy to create uh, ATP. And they do it in very small steps, transferring those electrons to lower and lower energy states. So in glycolysis, in the Krebs cycle, uh, high energy electrons are created. Carbon dioxide is ultimately given off. And those electrons carrying a negative charge will eventually go to lower and lower energy states along the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane, uh, resulting in protons being pumped out, kind of like bacteria rhodopsin, which is why we showed that example. And then those protons come back in a coupling sense, they produce ATP. So that's called chemiosmosis. So any questions now? Uh, we will start with electromagnetic processes in cells. Uh, neurophysiology will discuss some cardiac physiology, photoreception, and cochlear implants, how the ear uh, can hear with uh, devices. So I'll pause here. Okay, we'll start again. Uh, now we will proceed to cellular electromagnetic processes in biology. Neurophysiology, cardiac physiology, photoreception, and cochlear implants. Cochlear uh, 
implants are in the ear. So let's start with some basic neurophysiology. Uh, we discussed this a little bit earlier, but nerve cells, which produce those action potentials that we discussed uh, and reviewed, which result from the shifts in sodium and potassium ion conductance, these nerve cells are separate from each other and they communicate via what's called a synapse. In other words, a information electrical activity from one cell is transmitted to another cell from one neuron to another neuron or a muscle cell via the synapse. So this is a depiction of that. You have what's called a presynaptic neuron and then the synapse and then the postsynaptic neuron. So information is transferred from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron. The information we're talking about is those action potentials that are defined by the shift to the sodium and then the delayed shift to the potassium conductance in the membrane of the neuron. And the results that we talk about are in the postsynaptic neuron can be of either three types, the results or the information that is uh, uh, the activities in the postsynaptic neuron that result from the transfer of information across the synapse. The first type of change can be a local potential. In other words, a small electrical change of uh, a few millivolts, up to 10 millivolts or so, a small electrical change across the membrane of the postsynaptic cell, either a positive uh, as depicted here, or a negative as depicted in the second curve. The Second type of result can be a full action potential in the postsynaptic neuron, and that's depicted in number two here. And the third possibility, uh, which is not exclusive, it can also happen in addition to these electrical changes, but the third possibility is biochemical changes. In other words, the postsynaptic cell uh, and the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell or the synapse undergo some uh, substantial long-term changes, either in their structure, in their molecules, in the number of synapses, uh, etc. Uh, and those biochemical changes are what underlie the process of learning. So there are two types of these synapses. One is uh, electrical synapses, which involve a direct flow of ions from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic cell. These electrical synapses are seen in systems that often are not required to learn, but basically to transmit very quickly. So the heart actually is one of these where the electrical signal through the heart has to be propagated very quickly across the whole heart. And it's not really a learning organ like the brain is. And so electrical synapses are very common in the heart. Chemical synapses are more complex and they involve some sort of neurotransmitter or chemical being released from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell. And the process here is some excitation through that presynaptic uh, action potential we described. Then the transmitter being released across the uh, synaptic cleft or space between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neurons and then various actions occurring, number four. Those various actions, as I described, are summarized uh, as we did. Now, another very fifth characteristic of the synapse will be what's called an off signal, or how do we turn off this activity of the neurotransmitter? So this is a uh, animated depiction of that. We have the presynaptic cells, now resting potential. It then has an action potential, that action potential will release vesicles, and those uh, neurotransmitters will bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic cell, and then you can see other actions happening, in this case, another voltage change. Again, neurotransmitter coming out, and notice that this neurotransmitter will be X'd out, somehow taken up, somehow destroyed. That is what we call the off signal. This is a, another depiction, uh, a little bit more detail of synaptic transmission. Uh, 
in this case with serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter involved in mood in the brain. And the off signal is controlled by a serotonin reuptake transporter that pulls in serotonin back into the presynaptic terminal and then recycles it into these vesicles. So that's the off signal. So the neuromuscular junction is a similar concept to the synapse. The neuromuscular junction is a synapse between the neuron and the muscle cell, uh, as opposed to between two neurons. But the concept is very similar. It involves a uh, release of a neurotransmitter. In many cases, this is acetylcholine. And that uh, neurotransmitter will bind to the acetylcholine uh, receptor, which allows sodium to come in and creates a voltage change. There is also a acetylcholinesterase or a enzyme that quickly destroys the acetylcholine and so basically makes this into a defined circumscribed signal. If you didn't destroy the acetylcholine, then this would stay around and the muscle will be in a constant state of uh, contraction because you have a sustained action potential. And in fact, that, that eventually will uh, kill the cell. Another very interesting concept is calcium. So when this voltage comes down here, the action potential, it will release calcium or it will internalize calcium and then cause these vesicles to move and fuse with the presynaptic membrane. <coughs> uh, as we learned earlier, calcium is a very interesting ion. It's often a signaling ion. And if you remember from the periodic table, uh, sodium ions were fairly large. Potassium ions were even larger, although sodium ions, when they have a water shell around them, are the largest of the ions. And the calcium ions are the smallest of the positively charged ions. The negatively char charged ions are generally larger. So calcium is very small. It's about half the size of the sodium ion. And in addition, it is calcium two positive. In other words, there are two charges there. And uh, those two charges mean that the charge density of calcium ions is very high. And being relatively small, it can move quickly. Uh, it's relatively light. So it diffuses rapidly. It has a high charge density. So it is an ideal ion to be involved in signaling. Uh, sodium and potassium are involved in the membrane potential, which is a kind of signaling. But calcium binds to proteins and actually alters their conformation turns them on, turns them off, opens channels, closed channels. Those of you who have familiar with calcium, with uh, biology will have known about the, the role of calcium. They're also involved in the sarcomere. They bind to uh, actin and myosin, uh, specifically to tropomyosin and mediate the interaction of actin and myosin. So calcium is always involved, it is often involved in regulating proteins. And it's very high charge density and rapid diffusion are important characteristics that make calcium ions ideally suited for such a job. So indeed, in the neuromuscular junction, we see that phenomena with calcium. So as I mentioned, in the postsynaptic membrane, we can have some local potentials that can be either positive or negative, and we call these excitatory synapses that create a positive local potential. They're generally with the glutamate as the neurotransmitter, and sodium comes in, creating a more positive on the internal side. Inhib inhibitory synapses are often with uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, as the neurotransmitter, and in this case, they open up channels for chloride. In other words, they make the inside more negative. It becomes an inhibitory synapse. 
So more positive excitatory, more inhibitory. So this is uh, depolarizing, which is positive, more positive. And this is hyperpolarizing, the blue line, which is more negative. And so if you have enough of a excitatory postsynaptic potential, such as by glutamate, that exceeds the threshold, then we have an action potential. <laughs> So the brain is a mix of these uh, excitatory, inhibitory synapses and um, uh, various medications, for example, for anesthesia and so forth, will work on these in different ways to either activate or suppress uh, brain function. So this neuromuscular junction plays a role in reflexes. This is a typical reflex. So we see these electrical signals moving uh, from the uh, sensory neurons down to the spinal cord or up to the spinal cord. A uh, motor neuron is then activated uh, to then stimulate the muscle through the neuromuscular junction to uh, contract. And a typical reflex is a so-called patellar uh, stretch reflex. So uh, the brain, basically gives instructions to the muscle to be at a certain length. But if there is a uh, adjustment to that set length, the uh, muscle and spine will compensate to keep it at that set level. And we're talking about in milliseconds and very short period of time. So in other words, if you decide to stand up, you stand up straight. If you decide to sit, you sit up straight and the alterations in the shifts in the muscle length are controlled uh, automatically through these reflex arcs. Now, a patellar reflex where a doctor, nurse will uh, uh, tap the patella, patella tendon, uh, will abruptly change that length of that muscle. In fact, it will stretch it out. That's why it's called a stretch reflex. And that muscle is programmed to stay at a certain length. So the reflex or response will be to contract. So a stretch reflex will then come through a sensory neuron, activate the contraction. And so the muscle contracts to try to maintain this stable state. And that's the nature of the uh, reflex arc. I should mention that afferent is a sensory and efferent is motor. And this is a demonstration of that. So we have all this electrical activity in the brain, uh, positive, depolarizing, excitatory. We have negative, polarizing, or hyperpolarizing, uh, more uh, inhibitory. So positive, polarizing, the depolarizing, excitatory, negative, hyperpolarizing, inhibitory. So if we have too much excitatory activity, at some point we get uh, uncontrolled electrical activity in the brain. And that results in a condition known as epilepsy. Epilepsy is a tendency towards recurrent seizures unprovoked by any kind of uh, systemic or neurological causes. Sometimes people will get seizures if they uh, don't have enough uh, of certain nutrients They'll get seizures if uh, they have too much alcohol or some other toxins. But uh, if people are getting seizures without any of these definable causes, we call that epilepsy. There are two types of epilepsy. There is a focal epilepsy or you know, a localized spot of the brain or generalized. In other words, the whole brain is involved. So the brain has many regions. Uh, there are regions for speaking, there are regions for vision, there are regions, uh, regions for uh, hearing, there are regions for uh, movements and other sensory inputs as well. So this is a very rough summary of that. We have in the front part of the brain more movement and in the back part of the brain, posterior part of the brain, more sensory activity. So a focal seizure is one that it starts with electrical activity, uncontrolled electrical activity in one portion of the brain. And that can spread uh, to a localized region and this results in what's called a focal or partial seizure. 
a partial seizure can then actually spread more widely, and we call that a partial seizure with secondary generalization. So the electrical activity goes around the whole brain. Uh, this is in contrast to a primarily generalized seizure, which occurs just uh, at the beginning as electrical activity across the whole brain. So this will be the kinds of movements. We have a motor seizure. Uh, we could also have sensory seizures. People smell things, they see or they hear uh, sensations or memories. Uh, those would be partial seizures. But the classic seizure is one that involves the whole brain and obviously the most, up, the most uh, visible symptom is the motion of the arms and legs uh, in response to this electrical activity. So how do we measure the electrical activity of the brain? We use what's called an electroencephalogram or EEG. And this is the brain with the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, which is on the side, and the occipital lobe, which is in the back, and the temporal lobe, uh, which is uh, near the ears. Uh, and then we put various uh, electrodes over that uh, brain, and we have a normal EEG, looks something like this. The occipital lobe has a lot of activity, typically at rest, if you're looking at things, because the occipital lobe is related to vision. So you'll see a little bit of activity here, because the eyes are always working unless you close them. That's a normal resting EEG. In a partial seizure EEG, you'll see some regions having some activity, excess activity. And in a generalized seizure, you'll have all of the regions having electrical activity. Uh, and typically, during those generalized seizures, in addition to the movements, you'll also have the person lose consciousness. So how do we treat these uh, epilepsies? So remember I said we had the excitatory synapses depolarizing, and then mostly glutamate, and then we have the uh, inhibitory synapses, or hyperpolarizing, more negative, and mainly glutamate, uh, excuse me, uh, GABA. So it turns out that GABA is a very key molecule that's involved in anti-epileptic drugs. So you can see the GABA receptor here. This is the inhibitory synapse. And so benzodiazepines, barbiturates, which are uh, suppressed brain activity, uh, act actually to stimulate the GABA receptor. So that increases the amount of hyperpolarization. Uh, other drugs such as phenytoin, carbamazepine, uh, work to actually inhibit the excitatory response. Uh, other drugs also block the glutamate receptor, block the calcium channel that are involved in these excitatory synapses. So antileptic drugs uh, basically uh, enhance the inhibitory synapses or uh, activate or, or inhibit or block the excitatory synapses. <clears throat> so now we're going to shift and talk a little bit about cardiac physiology. And there's lots of electromagnetic phenomena involved in cardiac physiology. So this is a uh, depiction of the heart. And there are essentially two types of cells, two types of fibers in the heart. The first are what we would call specialized fibers, and these are here in the sinoatrial node, the atrioventricular node, and the atrioventricular bundle. And they are essentially uh, nerves with a little bit of muscular uh, characteristics, but essentially nerves that extend throughout the heart in an organized way. And you might recall we talked about the electrical synapses. These fibers are all interconnected by electrical synapses so that uh, when the electrical activity as an action potential begins in the sinoatrial node, it will quickly be transmitted to the rest of the heart. And by quickly, I don't mean instantly. It will still take several tens to hundreds of milliseconds, and that's an important point, but it is fairly quick. Uh, so that the heart as a whole will contract uniformly and synchronously. Now, if you look at these specialized fibers, which are essentially the electrical signal work for the heart, you'll see that the action potential is a little bit strange. 
not exactly that sharp peak that we have seen so far with the neurons. And we'll talk about the shape of this and how it relates to the electrical activities in the membrane. Then the second type of fiber are the actual muscle fibers, or we call them the working fibers in the heart. And they have an even stranger looking action potential that's spread out <coughs> and looks like uh, a wider action potential with a plateau here. And again, we will talk about uh, how that occurs. So let's first focus on the working fibers the working fibers and the cardiac action potential. So this is the resting potential. It's dominated by the potassium, as you can see. And here is the upstroke of the action potential and it's dominated by sodium conductance, which is exactly like what happens in neurons. And then when we go back down, <coughs> you have a delayed potassium conductance the voltage-gated potassium channel, which is a little bit slower than the sodium uh, voltage-gated sodium channel, and so you have the downstroke. So then the question is, what accounts for this plateau? Normally in a neuron, this will go up and down, and the plateau is maintained. And the plateau is maintained for two reasons. One is that the potassium, voltage-gated potassium channels in the heart activate even slower than in a neuron so that there's a delay here. And then the other interesting thing, this plateau is sustained by incoming calcium. Remember, calcium is high outside. It comes in, it will create more positivity on the inside, thereby depolarizing the membrane, just like sodium. So this calcium functions two roles. One is to depo keep the membrane depolarized but remember I said that calcium is a small ion with a double charge, has a very high charge density, and is involved in signaling. And so all that muscle, the myosin and the actin, et cetera, that's controlled by calcium, so you have these uh, nanomotor changes in the proteins to cause that contraction in a very short period of time, that's controlled by calcium. So the purpose of the calcium coming in here is to maintain the plateau and secondly to control the muscle. So it's a very ingenious system and you want to maintain it for a certain period of time as the heart contracts. <clears throat> so the specialized fibers have a really unusual uh, profile as we mentioned. So they're a little bit sharper, they, they don't have the plateau but they have what's called a pacemaker potential, which is the resting potential is not stable. It is slightly increasing. And that slightly increasing is due to a calcium current that's leaky and allows this to slowly approach the threshold, which then creates the voltage-gated sodium potential. So this process is called automaticity. The fact that the resting potential is not flat creates a oscillator type phenomena. And so this is most evident in the sinoatrial node, the heart's natural pacemaker. So it should be noted that the slope or how fast this calcium current comes in will determine the speed of the heart rate. If the slope is high, so that it reaches the threshold quickly, then the rate will be high. If the slope is low, it reaches the threshold slowly, the rate will be slow. And this slope, and more specifically, the amount of calcium that comes in a certain amount of time, the rate of calcium influx uh, and the permeability, this slope is determined by or controlled or influenced by the autonomic nervous system. So in periods of stress, when the heart rate goes up, the sympathetic nervous system will increase the slope. In periods of rest, when the parasympathetic nervous system is more active, the slope will be lowered. So the autonomic nervous system can also modulate this automaticity. So as I mentioned, the heart has this electrical activity going approximately from the top to the bottom, from the sinoatrial node down to the ventricles and around. 
it does not happen instantly. So in, at the beginning, you have a depolarization up at the sinoatrial node, but the rest of the heart is still at resting potential. Over time, that wave will go down and the uh, sinoatrial node will return. Uh, and so that wave is going down means that we have a section that's depolarized, a section that is not depolarized or resting, which means we have a dipole. We have a difference in charge in the surface of the heart. That difference in charge can be picked up by an electrode, which we call an electrocardiogram. So this is the ECG tracing. An electrocardiogram basically picks up changing electrical uh, distributions over the surface of the heart. We have what's called a P wave, which is the atrial depolarization at the very top. We have a larger QRS wave, which is the ventricular depolarization. <clears throat> then uh, that plateau, as I mentioned, will eventually come back and depolarize, and we have ventricular repolarization. This is the isoelectric point here. Now, some of you may have heard about heart attacks, and the basic concept of a heart attack is a blood vessel in the heart becomes blocked. And when the blood vessel becomes blocked, as you can see here, we have some sort of uh, dead heart tissue. So this is the blockage, and you can see this is dead heart uh, muscle distal or further away from the blockage because blood is not getting there. So if the heart muscle is not active or it's dead, then the electrical activities will not occur in that tissue. And so an EKG by the pattern can pick up where there is non-active heart tissue. So this is a little bit of a, a diagram of that. If we get a uh, infarction, infarction is lack of blood flow in a certain part of the heart, we will get uh, what are called Q waves. And then if there's a complete blockage, we get what's called ST elevation. Uh, and ST elevation is here, you can see uh, the, the uh, EKG starts to look different. If we open up the blood vessel with some sort of uh, clot busting molecule like a thrombolysis, or we, we actually put a stent in there, we can actually see the EKG return back to normal, return back to a non-ST elevation. And that means the muscle is working, there's electrical activity. So we can be very sensitive to the electrical activity distribution over the heart. Uh, and so the EKG is distributed, the EKG electrodes are distributed in a, a fixed manner. And so this is the different electrical activity ac across these different leads. So it's not exactly the same. So if you have an acute coronary syndrome, which is this blockage, it, it will affect the EKG in certain patterns. You can see the ST segment elevation here, dead heart muscle. And so if the EKG leads have this ST elevation in different leads, we know different areas of the heart are influenced by that. So the inferior lower section, in the case of EKG leads two, three, and F being changed. Uh, and that corresponds to a certain artery called the right coronary artery. If V1 and V2 are affected, we get the posterior myocardium, and that's related to the right coronary artery as well. Uh, if we get V2 and V4 or V3 and V5, we have the uh, front side of the heart, the anterior side, and that's more the left anterior descending ar artery, the LAD. Uh, so various patterns here can be deduced on the basis of the EKG. Uh, it's now five, uh, three o'clock. Let's take a uh, 10 minute break here. Uh, and we will continue with photoreception, another electromagnetic activity or process that occurs in cells. So we'll take a 10 minute break here and continue with photoreception. So in this uh, next section of electromagnetic processes in biology, focusing on cells, we're going to discuss photoreception. So what is the visible spectrum? Remember we had the question, uh, why is the sky blue? Uh, well, it's blue because of the physics reasons of the scattering of particles and molecules by light 
uh, particularly the scattering of uh, smaller dimensions, namely blue, uh, is more scattered than red light. And, uh, but the second reason why the sky is blue is because indeed we see blue light. And blue light is at the higher energy scale, lower wavelength scale of visible light that goes up into purple. And the lowest energy, lowest uh, frequency, longest wavelength of visible light is in the red. And this is the wavelength in nanometers. And this is what we call the visible spectrum or visible light. So that is what we can see. Uh, in fact, what is scattered in the sky is uh, a lot of ultraviolet as well. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of infrared around as well, but uh, we see uh, blue light. And so that is a major reason, of course, or one of the reasons why we see, quote unquote, the sky is blue. So this is the visible spectrum. So then this is electromagnetic radiation. Uh, as we talked about going all the way from the radio waves to gamma rays, visible light is in the middle here. And that is what we see. So the question is, how does the eye see? So the anatomy of the eye uh, has two chambers uh, separated by the lens. So light comes in here and eventually will result in signals in the optic nerve going to the brain here, the occipital lobe in the back as we described. So there are two chambers in the eye. One is the anterior chamber, and the second one is the posterior chamber. And as I mentioned, separated by the lens here. So light comes through the anterior chamber, focused by the lens, uh, is focused on the retina. Uh, and then eventually, as we'll see shortly, electrical activity will ensue that results in electrical impulses, the action potentials down the optic nerve. Now, the eye itself has three layers, an outer, dense connective tissue. We talked about the connective tissue uh, in an earlier lecture called the sclera. And then a middle layer called the choroid and this inner layer, which is the photoreceptive area layer called the retina. And this is a, a fundoscopic view or it's a, a light uh, visual view of the retina. And you have what's called the fovea, which is the highest concentration of uh, rods that are a type of cell that is photosensitive and we'll talk about those cells we have the macula which is slightly wider distribution of fairly sensitive cells and then we have uh the rest of the eye he, uh, retina here and the optic nerve displaced uh, somewhat from that so the visual pathway involves light going through the retina and eventually impinging upon these rods and cones. And the retina itself is not just a layer of, a single layer of cells, it's actually multiple layers. And so you can see there are crest, uh, Muller cells, uh, ganglion cells, amacrine cells, bipolar cells, horizontal cells, and finally the photosensitive rod and cone cells. So light comes from the outside and passes through actually a lot of different cells and eventually impinges upon the rods and cones. So a couple questions arise. If these are the photosensitive cells, then why do we have all these extra cells? And the second question is, if all these extra cells are here, why, why isn't the light being disturbed uh, or absorbed by these cells. Well, cells of the body are in general quite uh, transparent. Uh, they, they absorb light broadly, uh, but a single layer of cells, a double layer of cells, three layers of cells will absorb light very minimally. Uh, and so biological cells are actually fairly transparent. So there is not a lot of light that's absorbed by these cells intervening. It's a very thin layer. Then the, sec the, the first question was, what are they doing there? And they serve as a kind of computational machinery, which we'll talk about shortly, that actually computes uh, characteristics of the image in before it actually sends it to the occipital lobe of the brain. So the retina is not just a photosensitive organ, and we'll describe the process of that shortly, uh, 
it is also a computational order. This is a little bit uh, description of the visual pathway. So one of the important facts is that the sensory pathways in the brain cross, and that's true for the visual pathway as well. So you'll see here uh, the medial field, uh, the nasal field uh, will, sh will uh, cross over. The temporal retina will not cross over. That's actually the nasal field. The nasal retina is the temporal field, temporal referring to the outside here. And so if you have lesions in these optic nerves in certain areas, you'll have certain def defects. So if you have an optic nerve lesion right in the left eye, you won't be able to see out of the left eye. If you have a lesion right at the uh, chiasm or the crossing over, you'll actually lose vision to the outside because the nasal retina is bringing in information from the temporal or outside fields. Uh, this is actually more common than you might imagine, a lesion right at the crossing point, and that's often due to a pituitary tumor. If you have a lesion out in uh, the occipital lobe here, you'll have uh, vision on the opposite side uh, compromised. And that's, for example, a stroke on the left side. You won't see things very clearly, or you'll ignore things that are on the right side. So as I mentioned, the retina is not just a photosynthetic organ, it's also a computational engine. And this is a paper that I wrote while I was uh, at the Samsung Central Corporate Research Lab. Uh, where we described a computationally efficient real-time motion recognition based on bio-inspired visual and cognitive processing. So the concept here was that uh, uh, we use AI, we use uh, neural networks and deep learning in order to uh, recognize images. Now that takes a lot of computational power. So if you take a normal camera and combine it with a microprocessor, uh, the microprocessor works very hard to compute those images. But if you have a camera that has a computational element with certain uh, uh, features that are computed in advance, then the microprocessor AI and the microprocessor computational requirements are much less. And that's why we call it computationally efficient real-time motion recognition. Uh, so those cells, the amacrine cells, the horizontal cells, and the bipolar cells, and the Mueller cells, are involved in essentially uh, detecting edges as well as motion in the images. And so the information that is sent to the brain is not individual pixels like a normal camera, but is in fact a pre-computed uh, information about edges. That's so. Uh, uh, objects that are not changing basically are ignored and motion. And those are specifically exciting the cells in the brain. So let's go to the photosensitive part. That was the computational part. So the photosensitive part has two types of cells called the rods and the cones. Uh, the rods are approximately more elongated and uh, cylindrical. The cones are more like a cone. The rods are found more in the periphery of the retina. The cones are typically found in the fovea and macula. Uh, the rods are related to night vision. The cone cells are related to uh, day vision. They need a bright light to work. Uh, the rod cells are relatively low resolution. The cone cells are relatively high resolution. Uh, the rod cells are basically all wavelengths of light. Uh, color, so they are essentially black and white, light or no light, whereas the rod cone cells, there are three varieties for red, green, and blue, and so they can pick up different colors. So the type of vision correspondingly in the rod cells is black and white, and in the cone cells is color. They have different rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is a molecule that looks like bacterial rhodopsin. So you might be wondering why we spend time on bacterial rhodopsin that proton pump protein. Well, this is one of the reasons why we spend time discussing that protein because it's relevant to these rod and cone cells. So they have a protein called rhodopsin, which is light sensitive, just like bacteria rhodopsin was light sensitive. Uh, the rod cells are quite prevalent. The cone cells are much fewer in number. So this is a rod cell. 
the photosynthesis receptor unit here, and it has a nucleus, uh, mitochondria, and ultimately a presynaptic terminal here. Inside this photoreceptor and the membranes is rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is a seven transmembrane helix protein, just like bacteria rhodopsin. And guess what? It also has a retinal molecule in it. Retinal that will shift on the basis of light that comes in. Now, this retinal molecule is interesting. Most of you are familiar in uh, organic chemistry that it has these alternating double bonds. One, two, three, four, five, six double bonds that are alternating. Uh, to make a long story short, these valence electrons or these outer electrons become much lower energy in their different energy levels. So you remember we talked about energy levels. And they become low enough energy that visible light can excite them. In general, atoms or electrons in atoms cannot be excited or inter interact with visible light. In terms of quantum mechanics, the energy is just not enough. Uh, so visible light doesn't, doesn't interact with uh, the electrons in these atoms. Uh, X-rays will interact with the inner electrons of atoms and to some extent uh, ultraviolet radiation will inter interact with some of the outer electrons of atoms. Now there is an exception, uh, transition metals, uh, which have very uh, weak outer electrons, uh, can often be colored and so those transition metals as atoms can interact with some visible light. And that's why you have various metals uh, in solution being of various colors, copper uh, being uh, green, um, iron being red, uh, cobalt being blue and so forth. So those transition metals can interact with visible light. But in general, visible light does not interact with electrons uh, in, that are bound. But in these colored molecules, like retinol, which is found in related to molecule in oranges, I mean not oranges, in the orange of carrots, tangin. So that, uh, that these colored molecules have these extended arrays of electrons that have low energy uh, transitions that can be excited or interact with visible light. So remember we said at the beginning in an early lecture that these energetic transitions are very critical for how they interact with electromagnetic radiation. So this molecule is perfectly designed to interact with um, visible light. Now, this is the rod cell. You also have this rhodopsin in the cone cells, but you have three different kinds of rhodopsins that respond to three different kinds of colors. So the retinal is the same molecule, but the environment around the retinal is a little bit different. So its electronic states are sensitive to different colors of light. So how does photoreception work? Light comes in, the cis retinal is converted to the trans retinal, uh, <coughs> which is actually the opposite of uh, with the bacteria rhodopsin. That will cause a shift in the protein structure that will activate a G protein, and that G protein will then activate a sodium channel, which will cause a hyperpolarization, basically a excitatory uh, local potential. So 11 cis retinal absorbs light. I summarize the trans retinal. The transretinal dissociates, the activated opsin activates a G protein. The G protein will activate phosphodiesterase and uh, lower cyclic GMP will close the sodium channel. This will, uh, sodium entry decreases, it will hyperpolarize the cell. So it actually will create a more uh, hyperpolarized uh, negative potential. And that ultimately will lead through the uh, amacrine cells, horizontal cells, and so forth to activate the optic nerve. So the final uh, point for today is on the cochlear uh, implants and how hearing works.
So we will talk a little bit about sound waves, which are of course different than electromagnetic waves, but these sound waves, just like light waves, will also interact and create electrical activity. So how are sound waves ultimately detected? So you have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear transmits vibrations to the inner ear through the middle ear. So the middle ear function is to convert sound waves from air to essentially fluid. This fluid has a membrane that varies in its width through a tube. And that membrane is called the basilar membrane. And this basilar membrane, as I mentioned, has different dimensions as you go further out. Uh, very close to the base where it's connected near the tympanic membrane, it's very narrow. Very far from the base, it's quite wide. And so, uh, when sound comes through and it vibrates this basilar membrane, the vibrations will occur at different frequencies, different wavelengths, and will essentially be at a peak at different areas of the basilar membrane. So for example, high frequencies will peak closer to this window, middle frequencies will uh, peak somewhere in the middle, and lower frequencies will peak further down the basilar membrane. And the hair cells are also going to have certain length of the stereocilia that respond to these vibrations. And so the hair cells are also tuned to different frequencies. So high frequency is down near the base, uh, low frequency is near the apex. So you have a complex sound that comes in and it becomes uh, separated out by its individual frequencies. So a complex set of frequencies gets distilled or separated into the individual constituent frequencies. So 16 kilohertz, four kilohertz, one kilohertz, and all the different frequencies in between. So the auditory nerve will have a tonotopic or frequency encoded uh, inputs. Again, action potentials, electromagnetic radiation. So cochlear implants essentially will uh, stimulate this basilar membrane directly uh, from a, a transmitter that will transmit sound into uh, these electrodes and then will actually create the electrical activity directly. So uh, the cochlear implant will be also tonotopic. It will have high frequency down near the base and lower frequency near the apex. And so this is actually a Fourier transform, which we talked about earlier. When it comes to electromagnetic radiation, Fourier transforms are very important. They are the decomposition of a wide range of frequencies into the individual frequency. It gives you a functional distribution of uh, the different frequencies multiplied by a certain uh, uh, factor here. So th all these amplitudes relate to how big this wave is in the exponential form, and that will give the big function. If we integrate that function along all those waves, we can uh, get the, uh, each wave, we can get what is the amplitude for the individual frequency. So the ear works as a Fourier transform of all the sound waves. So the sound waves, obviously it's a different physical phenomena, but in terms of waves, they have the same uh, concept. So that's the end of this lecture uh, for electromagnetic processes in biology to cells. Uh, we will continue next week with lecture number seven, focusing on organisms, and we'll talk about bioluminescence, bioelectric organs, electroreception, and magnetoreception. Or magnetoception. So uh, that's the end of this lecture. Thanks very much. And uh, I'll uh, be open for questions now.